Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CS Colloquium for today. I'm really excited to have Parissa um, Kordam Shidi uh, from Michigan State University presenting. She's faculty there in computer science, um, and she has done her postdoc at UIUC with Dan Roth. Before that, she did her PhD at KW Lewin. Um, and yeah, she's been She's done a lot of really, really interesting things over the years, uh, sort of culminating in this work that she's been leading um, basically internationally on declarative learning-based programming. Um, so she'll tell you a lot about what that means and how that can be pretty useful and maybe an interesting way to do uh, to approach machine learning problems. So I'd really like to welcome Parissa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samir, for invitation. And uh, it's a great pleasure to, to give a talk today here. Um, so I will be talking about declarative learning-based programming uh, for deep learning and reasoning over natural language. Um, so I start with an example of natural language understanding and uh, why is that challenging? Uh, if you assume that you're giving your robot instructions like, hey, you are just on time, please get me a piece of cake, it's in the kitchen and so on you see that there are some challenges for understanding this, like lexical variability. For example, you see the ver uh, words like above, on, they are um, with uh, similar semantics, but they are different words. Also, we have some structural variability, like uh, you can say um, on, on the cake on the kitchen's table or something with a, tab with, uh, a table with a cake on it. It's a different structure, but it is similar semantics. We have polysemy, like on can be temporal, spatial, or even you're on top of it is a metaphorical sense. And this causes all ambiguity in understanding natural language. We can also see that uh, often um, actually common sense and external knowledge is very important for, for understanding language. Like here, if you look at this expression, a vase on the ground on your left, if uh, we look at just the syntactic structure of this expression, you will see that ground on your left is something that you might infer, but actually we know that the ground cannot be on left, but actually we're talking about vase on your left. So this is um, uh, basically this piece of text that I show here is more spatial um, language. And um, we see that spatial language is related to the physical world. That's why when we are uh, like using objects and describing their locations, uh, most of the time also visual information is an external source of knowledge that can help us to understand language and disambiguate. Like here, when you say you see a door with a table on it, this might look weird, but if we have the visual information, we see that, okay, this is the table of numbers that we, or this launch schedule that we, we see here. So uh, visual information is very important. Uh, here um, also, if you, uh, you see this sentence here, a plate is under the counter in the drawer, utensils are next to it. Uh, again, if you don't have the visual information, it is hard to see, to understand if utensils are next to the plate um, under the counter or they are next to the counter. Um, for example. So if we have visual information, then we can disambiguate this. So this is a uh, special language and visual information, but we are also concerning like now designing models that are able to understand these modalities and connect, connect to each other automatically. So classically, when we think about language understanding uh, in the same environment, the instruction giving robots, we're thinking that the robot needs to understand objects in the environment, like it should understand the notion of table and then be able to recognize there are two tables, one of them is in front, and then be able to uh, understand all the, from the language that we're talking about which table, and then recognize the books uh, laying around, so assume these are the books, and then also understand like what does it mean the book that is on the table, for example, connecting the geometry of this um, visual environment with the meaning of on and then realize which book we are talking about. So this is a kind of more classical perspective that we need to uh, extract the information from language and have a formal representation for meaning understanding, like extracting the objects and their relationships like book on AI, uh, but maybe here we are concerning about locative information and book on AI is not important for us, which is the topic, but other spatial information here are important. 
if this extraction is helpful to, to be able to give the machine like the actual meaning, but it's not still operatable. The machine cannot operate on these extractions. So that's why classically we are thinking about formal meaning representation or symbolic meaning representation. That means thinking about objects as kind of lines, points, or some uh, n-dimensional objects, and then uh, thinking about how formally we can represent their relationships. This is a kind of traditional and classic uh, problem in AI. However, nowadays, given the uh, like deep learning era, like we, we often ask these questions, do we really need this symbolic conceptualization, let's call them, and formal representations? Why just not giving large data to deep learning models and learn representations automatically? So if we look at some of these uh, current recent uh, data sets and tasks that are released and people work on them, one of them is visual question answering. Uh, there, uh, there, there is an image and there is a question in natural language, like is the red bike to the right or to the left of the Asian people? And we, if we give this question to an actual model, so this we run an actual state of the art model that is built for this data set. And we see the model actually is doing well. It answers correctly. It says the bike is on the right. So this is really interesting. The model understands the bike, the left, um, the right. But actually we're asking another question, is the red bike to the left of the Asian people? It seems this should be easier to understand, uh, to answer. It's just yes, no question. And the, the model, the same model says no. So this is worrying, like does the model really understand objects, attributes and relations? And you might say, okay, you can give like all these variations of data, possible variations of the data, different forms of the same question and let the model to learn to answer all variations of this question. But does that solve our problem? Do we really, uh, are we really able to generate infinite number of examples to cover all possible situations and then just the deep learning model learns how to do, how to answer those. Um, so that is an issue actually for current deep learning models that they, they lack generalizability and interpretability. Uh, they need a huge amount of data for training. And this is though we hear a lot of um, interesting stories like deep learning models generating a, a full article that might make sense to us, but we see that they are really having uh, issues that are problematic if we want to rely on them for real world applications. So here in this talk, I will be going over like my uh, like older uh, studies on like how we do information extraction, and sem semantic representation, structured output learning. And then I uh, point to the recent works that we did in our group about uh, domain knowledge and uh, uh, including domain knowledge and these relational structures into deep models. And then I talk about declarative learning based programming as a paradigm that can help us to, to model uh, and design such, such models that are involving a structure and semantics. So the all the studies that I did for a special language, mostly under a, a mostly special language understanding, was to go into the uh, like semantic representations based on linguistic studies, um, and then identifying the objects, roles, and relations, and also like formal representations of the spatial information. So this was like getting us to something that is summarized in something like we call it the spatial ontology that tells us, okay, these are important concepts that you're going to uh, extract from the language. And these are the important um, type of um, formal spatial relations that you need to look at, like uh, topological, this is uh, partially overlapping, directional, this is left and distal information. And then we, ha having that ontology and conceptualization in mind, the approach is like now let us create data set for these um, uh, for these extractions and give it to machine learning to learn such extractions. So the data set, just to give you an idea, like what were the concept exactly? You can see this actual example from a data set uh, that was used actually for benchmark for a spatial information extraction over several workshops. So the, um, the text is like, there is a white large statue with the spirit arms on a hill. So here the statue is a trajectory, is an object that we're describing it. We have the hill, which is the landmark. 
And then we have this trigger, language triggers, we call the spatial indicator that describes the relationship between the statue and the hill. And then we have these triplets that are, uh, their type of them could be externally connected or above. So you give this data, we gave this data to, to human to annotate for us. And then we started learning from them. One problem that we face here is that creating such annotated data is, is hard. So though we are interested in like learning the actual semantics, but creating this data is a challenge. Just remember this that I get back to it later. But then given that uh, like a reasonable amount of data that we collected, we could do design models. Uh, this is going beyond classical um, classification or regression models. This is really a structured output learning. What I mean by that, this is we have all these ontological concepts and we need to assign parts of the sentence to this concept. Like on is an indicator, land hill is a landmark, tree uh, like a statue and he, um, hill and on forming a triplet that is a relation. This relation has a type which can be actually multiple types. It also has directional semantics and topological semantics and so on. And then we also, this is a kind of um, typical classic, uh, typical structured machine learning uh, problem. And also we have uh, this kind of structural properties that we want to preserve when we do such extractions from language. We want, for example, to have is a um, relationship to hold between the extraction when I say, some relationship is left, it should also be a directional and it should be also spatial, spatial. So this is a hierarchy should be hold. Or when I say something, some triplet is a spatial relation, then the parts should have a specific rules. Like the third, third argument should be a landmark, for example, um, or like mutual exclusivity. Like I cannot have left and right at the same time for a specific um, relation type. So this is what we call a structured output prediction models. We have some knowledge about how these output labels should relate to each other. And we want to make predictions that obey this structure. There are different techniques to solve this. For example, probabilistic graphical models. And uh, there is also a, a whole class of techniques that uh, are using integer linear programming to form the final uh, uh, the for, for, uh, final optimization that makes assignments to multiple variables uh, obeying the constraints that we are formalizing. So I'm just mentioning this here. I don't want you to look at these formulas. I want to point to some important things that we can encode this knowledge, ontological knowledge as linear constraints, basically, like uh, a word can be a trajectory uh, and cannot be at the same time a landmark. Um, for example, here we have the is a relationship. If a label holds at the uh, lower level of the ontology, it should also uh, hold at the higher level of the ontology, the is a relationship and mutual exclusivity and so on. And then we have an objective that includes all the variables like a special indicator candidates, trajectory candidates, pairs and triplets. So this is a huge objective. And then we solve this um, uh, assignment to these variables respecting to these constraints. What I want to say here is that solving these problems um, needs kind of programming for solving these problems is hard because we are forming this objective per example. Examples are different and automatic. I mean, if we are going to hand code this for each problem that we're solving, we need to, again, hard code how we're going to generate this optimization. And that's very time consuming. So this is the second problem, like, like designing, uh, designing uh, programs for structured out prediction needs customizing this, uh, your, your uh, algorithm based on your problem. It is very problem dependent. And we also continue the same trend of work, like using a structure, but also considering the visual information. Uh, like for example, we have uh, this sentence, a car in front of the house on the left. Uh, we um, actually, we don't know from the language itself that if the house is on the left or the car, but if we have the visual information, then we can look at these bonding boxes and look at the relationship from the visual modality and then disambiguate this proposition is attached to what. 
And this was just the uh, same type of approach using integer linear programming to do inference jointly, but now we had the vision modality too. And then we extract, we try to learn the relationship based on the bounding boxes and object types from the image side, and then form a, a global objective that includes all the variables from two modalities. And we added consistency constraints from the two modalities to decide, which gave us a boost in the results of the extraction of the spatial information. So to summarize what I wanted to point in this um, slide was like, we, uh, we were able to extract the spatial semantics at a reasonable accuracy level at the end. And then we, were, we showed that the structured output learning and using domain knowledge, what I call it domain knowledge in form of those linear constraints, those ontological constraints was helpful. And we also could use the consistency constraints as an external source of knowledge also to combine vision and language information. And that also helped a little bit to improve the accuracy of extraction of this information. But then the next question is that uh, how um, these uh, this extractions, these symbolic representations, how do, uh, those are helpful for doing more realistic uh, real world applications. And then if we are assuming that or hypothesizing that those extractions are helpful, how we can use those kind of a structure in deep learning models. So in the second part of the talk, I will be talking about now different types of um, problems that we solve like question answering, visual question answering um, and like um, navigation and we, in all of these tasks, we try to really model a structure or inject knowledge uh, in, in one way or another to, to really um, examine this hypothesis, how a structure can be helpful. So the main ideas and novelties of the work that I will briefly present here uh, are like uh, with deep learning, we try to learn higher order relational patterns from the data. And we wanted to show that symbolic and linguistic semantic structures can can help in deep learning. And also we wanted to show how we can do explicit re reasoning using um, a logical constraint with, with, uh, based on um, like models that use deep learning. So this work that is done by my student Chen, uh, it's, it was about the, the same example that I showed you in the beginning, like visual question answering. There is a question asked, and then we want to answer the question based on the image. Where is the child sitting? Arms or, uh, and in this image, it's, the answer is fridge. So the challenge is that we want to, we need to have representations from text, representation from the image, and then being able to align uh, the, two, the two spaces and two modalities. So the idea that we tried to uh, model here was basically based on deep learning. But what we wanted to do is, first of all, let me say that nowadays when we do this kind of task, this is inevitable that we need to start from rich, uh, rich pre-trained representations from the vision and language. And we have uh, transformers and complex models pre-trained on huge data. That is the usual to really exploit those pre-trained models and come up with some initial representation that you can, you can start with. So this is what, what this architecture shows. We start with some transformers here for like um, representation from the visual part. And then we have BERT, which is also transformer based language model that gives us rich representations from text. And also here we, we deal with multiple modalities. We have another layers of deep learning to give us to uh, put these two different spaces in one joint space. And then in that joint space, we will be able to compare objects representations in the visual modality with textual representations from text modality. And that's why we compute what we call a rel entity relevance matrix. And that matrix will give us the relationship between these objects and entities and actually helps us to ground, to find out which objects in the text are mostly grounded in the visual environment and they are present there. And then when we find this, we, we get the most relevant ones. And then we not only uh, compute the explicit relevance between objects and these bounding boxes in the image, but also we model the relationships here in a way that we look at pairs of like with these selected objects, we pair them. We, we look at the pairs of objects and also pairs of bounding boxes. 
and we compute the relevance between pairs as well. Because it's not that only we are caring about an object, but when we say like this bird looking left, so we are really looking at bird, bird that is looking at left. And we want to have a representation of this, this pair of like bird doing something. So, and that will be more powerful for like um, extracting this relational, what I call a relational patterns from the data. And this, this approach actually was pretty good because it, it helps to, to have like um, proceed the state of the art on visual question answering like VQA in version two data set is a famous one. We also have not only visual question answering, but there are other data sets like uh, this is, um, uh, it's not questions, it is a piece of text describing an image. And then the model should say if this description applies to the image or not. So the result of this uh, study showed that the modeling the relevance between entities and the relevance between relationships in the modalities could help deep learning to capture higher order patterns from the data. But then we also, with the same idea in mind, we want we are interested in like um, including this semantic, uh, uh, explicit semantic abstractions from the language part into the models. So we looked at some uh, other tasks that is called question answering. Here in this uh, in this model that I'm going to describe, we uh, we didn't have the visual information. It's just documents, uh, documents, and then a question. So you have. Uh, um, like um, questions and document is multiple paragraphs and then you want to answer the question and also say which pieces or which sentences actually were relevant and helps to answer the question. So this data set is interesting because uh, the questions are complex need uh, the answer needs to connect many things from different paragraphs and there is a line of reasoning path of reasoning that needs to be followed to find out the answer, for example, what team did this um, and what played for this. So um, the idea that we followed here like was like how we can use the semantic roles um, and the graph structure of the um, of the language um, in uh, to to solve this problem. So what I mean by semantic rules, I just, uh, for the people who don't have background in language, well, we have like a semantic role labeling uh, um, uh, task that actually tries to say, what is the predicate, when given a sentence, it says, what is the verb, or we call it a predicate, and what are the arguments attached to that verb? For example, if the subject is the argument one, uh, or the object is the argument two, so it identifies the predicate and arguments for you. And you see that here, I have good information, James Ross, is the argument one, born is the predicate, and December 1983 is the temporal argument. So this is good information, and we get a lot of good ab semantic abstraction from the language by this, let's say, semantic parsing or semantic role labeling, more precisely. Um, so then the idea was to exploit these semantics in, in designing deep models and see how that, how that helps for finding the answer to questions. So this is again based on deep learning, but we wanted to model the, exploit the semantics. So uh, the graphs are, uh, the sentences are all parsed with this semantic role labeler. Uh, we got this argument, predicate argument structure, put all sentences together. And then we tried also to use uh, like the edge information and node information and learn based on like graph neural networks and um, having this architecture, actually, we found the supporting facts and the predictions of the answers. So one thing that I should say, like with this, uh, with this uh, problem that we are trying to solve, was that the um, first of all we have large number of paragraphs, and it's not as easy to get like the huge graph of the old paragraphs. So we need to, to select the best, most relevant paragraphs first, and then form this graph of the two paragraphs that we selected and then try to um, address these predictions that is like answer uh, and also like the supporting fact predictions. So this is also published recently and we could like exploiting this semantic role labeling graph in, uh, in learning and uh, could, could help to, to proceed with the state of uh, the art of uh, results uh, on this data. And then um, this is the conclusion that we can get here that the linguistic semantic abstraction and structures actually helped in doing what we call multi-hub reasoning. You have multiple hubs and of reasoning that you need to follow to answer the question. 
And this is uh, the result is on some data set that is called hotspot QA. And then we also wanted to do the same thing, exploiting the semantics with spatial question answering and spatial reasoning. But the main issue here was that when we looked at all these data sets that are available, like Hotbot QA, Squad, and other uh, popular data sets that are existing, none of them had really a, uh, complex spatial reasoning that we can say, OK, this, uh, these uh, formalisms are necessary for that. So we, we had an idea that maybe since spatial information are related to visual, maybe we can um, uh, like generate data automatically based on the available visual information. And we followed that idea. So this is the work of Roshanek that did. Um, first, uh, we have this, um, this is from this NLDR data set that is uh, also a, um, a famous one in the community of vision and language. Uh, but we got just the images and, uh, and we tried to generate descriptions. So partly we gave to human to describe this, these images. And also she had a grammar, a designed a grammar that could generate the descriptions automatically. Like we have three blocks, this is actually automatic generated, like A, B, and C, and so on. And then the good advantage of this visual information is that you can generate questions and then you can find uh, valid answers based on the, the actual geometry of these objects here. Then uh, we could extract like different types of questions like find object, find block, find relations, and, and so on, make it like nesting reasoning, uh, difficult reasoning questions. And then the results were interesting. So we started with like just language models because language models are doing uh, like these transformer based language models doing so well on many tasks and like uh, beating the state of the art of many tasks nowadays that were done before. But now looking at this um, restricted environment, uh, manually automatically created data set, we even with that, we saw that the um, uh, the accuracy of these language models is not good. They are not really able to do a spatial reasoning. Looking, look at uh, some of these type of questions were easier, uh, but the yes, no ones um, actually like, like 79. I mean, this is, you might say, okay, this is good. But actually, if you look at a squad, which is questions in the Wikipedia text, the current models are above 80 near to 90. But here, this is a very limited vocabulary and the model is not able to, captures, uh, to capture the patterns of a spatial reasoning. And when we look at the human generated one, which should be similar actually to the, um, uh, to the automatic generated, but we see that the variety that human could make, actually it was even harder and harder to, to, um, uh, to answer the questions. So the data is large. So we fine tune the like BERT here on some other language models, but we see that the models are kind of failing to, to do a spatial reasoning. But you might say, okay, the, the data that we fine tune, it was fine tuned based on automatic uh, generated data. You might say, okay, the data maybe is not useful or you didn't generate it well. But actually here we show that this data that was generated is helpful even for answering questions on other external data set that were similar to what we had. Like Bobby was similar, including spatial information, but very simplistic, not with nested reasoning. So it, the, our fine tune and our automatic generated data could help uh, question answering on Bobby. And there was another uh, Boolean class, uh, question answering, like yes, no questions uh, called Bulkio data set that also we uh, applied fine tuning or automatically generated data helped a bit of improving question answering on bull QA. So it means the data is interesting. It helps the models to a bit capture some structures, but still the data is challenging. Um, so the results that we had was like semantic um, transformer based um, uh, language models actually failing kind of uh, to our evaluation fail to do a spatial reasoning. So, but this benchmark is created to evaluate that. And also we show that like this auto generated uh, corpus can be helpful. So this is back to my, to my point that I made, creating annotated data is hard, but if we have a, a way to generate this annotated data automatically and use it for supervision, that will be great. And here this setting help us to do, to do that goal because we actually know what is the trajectory, what is the landmark, what are the triplets. So we have the visual information, it's all structured. We generate textual information, but behind that we have all the 
fermentation. And that like can be used later. This is an ongoing study now that we can exploit those annotations and see how we can have more involved architectures going beyond just using language models to, to, uh, be, to enable the models to do a spatial reasoning. We also uh, investigated the same similar type of issues in another in a, like, um, uh, like application that is giving navigation instructions to the robot. Again, it needs to understand the vision, understand the language. Here are spatial instructions. And actually um, the results, the current existing model on this, uh, on this problem show that the current deep learning models ignoring a lot of information that is obvious, uh, that is kind of ridiculous. Like here, this paper, um, this is to ACL 2019. Actually, they're asking, are you looking? They realized that when they removed the information, the whole visual information, they trained a model and then measured the accuracy. When they removed the whole visual information, actually the model was just one person different. So actually the model didn't look at the visual information to, to uh, follow the instructions. Um, so this is kind of dangerous things that if we really blindly apply deep learning without modeling the structure, it's, we don't know, like if, even if they are doing correct, we, we don't know why this is happening. And this is, um, this is not applicable for real world, serious real world applications. So what we did in this direction, that is work of Jocelyn, um, try to model the spatial semantics of the instructions and try to put those structural information into the, again, deep architectures. So uh, the advantage of this, um, this uh, data, data and this application is that um, the navigation instructions, there is no ambiguity in the spatial language. It's not like you say on top of it, it's not metaphoric or temporal usage. Most of the prepositions or all of them actually are, are spatial. We can look at simply dependency parsing and extract the trajectories, landmark and indicators and motion. So that was good because we could extract this. Again, we didn't need to do manual annotation. And then uh, when she extracted this, we call here is an example, like go straight and pass the bar with chairs and stools. The one uh, challenge of this data set is that you don't get the um, sub instructions. You have a long paragraph instruction and you just see the agent following and get the goal. And the evaluation is just with the goal. There is no alignment that which instruction is related to which action. So then we just have this, but we decided to model this to decide to uh, split the instruction to what we call the spatial configurations, um, like go straight is one configuration and so on. And then we extracted these motion indicators and landmarks and we had a representation of configuration. This C1 to CM is all configurations related to, to the whole instruction. And then we um, augmented the representation of the configuration with the motion indicator and landmark representation. And then we have like, we uh, in this architecture, actually we use these configurations to control how the agent moves from one perspective to another. So it's kind of attention-based modeling, but then uh, it's good that the based on each configuration, the model learns to find out what to do at, at each step. And we also use the alignment between the actual landmarks and the visual objects here to again control this movement between the instruction and have a sequential order of the execution of these spatial configurations. So this kind of explicit modeling, it is, it can be still done with at the finer level spatial semantics. This was just a starting point, but it showed us a very good result actually. So we have like this is um, most, most important is like this SPL uh, uh, parameter here. It shows that we have like 61% um, like SPL rate. And then this is compared to these are actually 20, 2020 um, papers. Um, so we, we proceed this, but uh, we, with the unobserved environment, we are competitive. Uh, we are better than many other recent works. Uh, but uh, we are not the best. And that's because we don't really address the zero shot training for the visual environment. We are able to deal with, it's not that we are fitting, we are able to deal with the language variety and looking at the instruction structure, but we didn't do something specific to really deal with the new visual environment. So that's why it's reasonable that we improve in the observed environments. 
And the last thing that I wanted to mention, this is going back to using constraints, actually. Um, so we started, I started with the like looking at this ontology and show you that we could use this logical constraint in our classical structured output learning. But this piece of work is like now how we can use this domain constraints with, with deep learning. Um, and then uh, just I show you now a typical example that we usually use is entity mentioned relation extraction. And this, um, uh, this problem is that you have your given a sentence and you want to extract uh, what are people here, uh, location, and what are the organizations. And then, um, then here, if we, for example, use local classifiers, now they are deep learning models. And these local classifiers might look at Washington and say, based on these probabilities, it says it is a location. Okay, it makes sense. But then this guy also say, this classifier here says, this is Associated Press, uh, this is organization. And then uh, this guy here, work four, says the relationship between Washington and Associated Press is work four. However, we have this table of this, this is our domain knowledge here that says work four holds between people and organization. So it cannot be a location working for an organization. Uh, so we want to actually make a decision that is consistent with, with this domain knowledge that we have. And for that, our first classifier needs to change their mind and say, okay, this is people. So this is what we call inference. And then again, going back to the example that I had in the beginning, this could be formulated as an integer linear program. We have probabilities, we have linear constraints, and we can find the best solution, uh, best assignment to the variables that obey these constraints. And then that helps to really get better, better decisions. But now the issue is that how we're going to use this kind of constraints in the loop of training. Um, so the inference sometimes corrects the model, sometimes it might other way around. Actually, the, maybe the local models are correct. The inference makes it wrong, though actually it, it is consistent with the constraints still. Um, so that's why we need to look at like how we can um, use this inference in the loop of training and how we can change the way that we, um, we um, back propagate the errors if we have this inference. So this is a paper that was published recently, inference mass loss. The idea is kind of simple. We have like, the, the issue is that we cannot have this ILP, integer linear programming, it's not differentiable. So we cannot have it in the pipeline of our deep learning and take differentiations. So that's why we need to handle it in a different way. Usually we have this uh, lo uh, negative log likelihood, this is cross entropy loss that is used usually to measure the errors of our model when there is a prediction made. Remember here we have multiple predictions for different predicates like personal location and so on. But now that we have inference, we want actually to uh, get the output of our deep, uh, deep learning and then based on that output, give it to the inference and decide. And then based on like the behavior of the inference, decide if we're going to back propagate the error or not. So that's what we call mask loss. We, want, we are going to mask the loss based on the situation that, for example, the model is wrong, but uh, the inference can correct it. So here is the ground truth. Here is the local models output. And here is the uh, inference result. If the model should say one, and here, the, actually, the inference result is one, so we don't need to penalize. Even in the wrong cases, if the model should say zero, and then the, uh, basically the local model is, is saying one, but our um, inference says zero correctly, then we don't need penalize. So we are going to just decide if the decision is corrected with the inference, we, don't, we are not going to penalize the model. This has good things and then bad things also. Sometimes in some cases we see that if we are avoiding like penalizing, we rely a lot on the constraints for getting the right answer. And that's kind of it's, uh, like call it lazy penalizing it. And that might not um, actually um, make our local classifiers strong. So that's why at the end, we realize that we need to have a balance between how much we are going to use negative log likelihood and how much we want to use this new uh, inference mask loss and introduce a lambda parameter that could be tuned and 
used. So this is um, not good news. We need this parameter, but actually that is the way that it works. And then the analysis that we showed, uh, apart from like improving because the constraints are helpful, one interesting result of this is that with less training data, we do better here. And that makes sense because the constraints are actually alleviate the need for huge amount of data because they can do some of the work by just looking at the consistency of the outputs. So now at the like um, maybe 10 more minutes, I wanted to talk about uh, now we are going to like design um, models that look at the structure. We are interested in modeling like the knowledge in, in form of like constraints, ideally logical constraints or any other form like linear constraints. But then the current tools actually, they don't, um, they don't really support this kind of designing of the models. You need to have representations from your raw data in terms of matrices and work with that, and in terms of ten tensors and work with that. But we want to work at the conceptual level. So the real world problems actually, uh, the complex systems are, um, we have difficulties to, for designing them with current tools because there are many models. There are models that are not only basic concept that to be classified, but we have relations, we have relation types, we have compositional concepts, and the decisions that are made are not really like single uh, classifier or regression values. They are based on um, output of various models and how they are interacting with each other. So we are in real world, we're going towards solving more and more complex problems and we have more difficulties for designing those models. We have interaction with various types of data, heterogeneous from uh, various resources. We need to encode domain knowledge. I mentioned this in the beginning also that you remember for every uh, example that we have, like learning example, we need to really um, like encode an optimization if we want to do inference per example. And then per problem that also needs to be encoded differently. So encoding domain knowledge is at, at lower level. Uh, it's not independent from the algorithms that you're using. We have uncertainty and completeness noise in the data and machine learning is experimental. We need to try many different techniques. It's, uh, so, and we cannot, uh, before doing them, we cannot really theoretically say which one should be better. And then we have model composition. So ideal components of this such a language is like we need to have, we are talking about structure, we need to have data modeling, we need to have knowledge representation and reasoning and dealing with uncertainty in the data, learning from the data. And of course we are doing learning, exploiting data representations. And then we need to be able to design different uh, learning and inference paradigms. So finding the right abstraction and primitives that integrate all these components is a challenge. However, we know that there are uh, like most of these challenges like data modeling, logic representation, these are individually addressed in the whole computer science history. Like we have uh, first order logical languages that actually their uh, whole concern is like how to represent um, um, knowledge in logical way and how we can do efficiently reasoning based on logical representations, how we can combine these with probabilities and uncertainties and we can do inference. Deep learning libraries like uh, classical learning uh, models are tools that are addressing the learning issue um, you know, or deep learning issues and like combined par uh, paradigms that trying to exploit the logical and relational structure of the data and also uh, do the learning. Um, so this is a survey that I have that we are actually uh, showing in that survey how, what are the actual requirements and needs of the real world application nowadays, how the current abstractions trying to deal with those requirements, and do we need a kind of new abstraction that helps to, to do facilitate designing a real world application. And that's an abstraction that we call it declarative learning based programming. Um, so we have had like, a, an, uh, like an older work like uh, that also Samir uh, is here also was involved in this, in this work. We designed a language called Sol. It was an Scala library that we started to design explicitly a graph. That was where we started to, to do machine learning. We started to express the structure of our domain and concepts. And then for example, if you are solving a language problem, we are going to say, well, I have sentences, phrases, or I have a document, or I have paragraph. We just write the concept. And then we form a graph. We say, 
paragraphs contain sentences or sentences contain words and so on. Then we had a declarative query language that we could extract features. This was based on classical machine learning. So we could extract features. And uh, then we also had a language, a logical language to write our constraints, like trajectory is true, then the landmark cannot be true. And then by this is declarative specification, we could connect the concept to learners. And then uh, if I have all these, um, for example, concept trajectory, concept learner, I can connect them to learners. And then the learners will learn looking at these constraints. Uh, so it will be joint uh, learning for all um, concept together, respecting constraint. This is what we want. And then the modeling is easy because I don't need to hard code the, the optimization. I just need to write these logical declarative constraints. That was based on classical machine learning and a structured output prediction. Uh, but now we have a new project that is Dominoes. And in that project, we are doing the kind of same ideas, but based on deep learning libraries. Uh, so we have the same starting point when we, we start. This is Python code now. That was a Scala, but this is Python. Um, so we have uh, we start with a definition of our concept and relationships. I have words, phrases, uh, sentences contain words. I have like output concept like people. People are word. Organizations are word. And maybe I have relations that are uh, pairs that are relations, and they have two arguments. So we define this, and then we have constraint declaration like these labels are disjoint that's only thing that i need to write or nand l people and organizations the, the nand of the two should be correct and then we actually we do this declaration and then now here we can co connect this concept to what what we call sensors these sensors can be learned representations or they can be deep learning modules and then we can combine them seamlessly and form complex models uh, with with uh, like these declarations and like just having declared how we want them to to be uh, modeled uh, another advantage of this uh, this framework that we're designing is that sometimes we have large amount of like like huge ontologies constraints that are written in a standard ontology format, we don't want to rewrite them all with this language that we invent. We want to automatically extract the constraints from these um, well-established uh, uh, ontology representations. And that's also something that we are covering now, like not all full old representation, but some of the uh, usual constraints that are expressed in there, uh, we, can, we can cover and automatically compile them into our deep learning models. To summarize, um, so we uh, we wanted to um, to model uh, basically a structure and domain knowledge into learning. We used con logical constraints uh, between output variables in the, some of the works that I showed you. We tried to ex um, um, exploit the explicit structural patterns and relational patterns from the data. We want to exploit semantic structures and graph structure of the uh, linguistic semantics into like real world applications like question answering. And then we wanted to build tools and abstraction, new abstraction for designing these kind of models that we start with um, structured representation and we express our knowledge at a high level. Uh, we focused on um, solving natural language and combining language and vision problems. The future direction, this framework that we have started, is it has a long way to go. It's we even haven't released it because um, it's we want it to be easy to use, and it becomes complex. Things become very complex easily. So um, hopefully, in very near future, we can uh, release a version. But it is still continuing how we can uh, easily declare different types of uh, knowledge and also even procedural knowledge. I didn't have time to uh, talk about procedural knowledge and the work that we have started in this area, uh, but uh, the representation of those in the framework is another uh, is one to do that we have. And then we have um, domain knowledge in different forms, hard constraints, soft constraints, preferences. We have implemented some ideas and some I so based on our papers and some ideas based on other papers in the framework, but this is uh, still a challenge and it's an interesting research question. Uh, how we can combine different optimization techniques. I have ILP, I cannot take differentiations. In many real world problems, we have different um, 
optimization in pipeline and you want to learn an end-to-end -end, maybe deep learning model that uh, these small optimizations are, are part of it. How we want to deal with this heterogeneous, what I call this global heterogeneous optimization problems. How we can compose end-to-end -end model, uh, compose uh, small models and build end-to-end -end models in different ways easily. And then looking at even other real world problems beyond vision and language like scientific discovery, especially for this heterogeneous optimization problem is an interesting thing that we might look at it in the future. Um, so thank you very much. This was much my talk. These are some links related to workshops that I usually have been organizing for declarative learning based programming. Please check out these links. And on a special language, we also regularly organizing workshops. Um, and I would like to thank you, my, uh, my um, collaborators, postdocs and students for, for helping doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, so we can have questions now. Either you guys can enter the questions in the chat um, or you can also unmute yourself and ask questions. Let me, let me sort of start off while people are composing their thoughts. Um, so uh, what do you think is the sort of future direction of this kind of work as you know the deep learning models become more and more multitask, I guess? So more recently, I guess past year, year and a half in NLP, uh, there are models that just by framing the right question, you're able to get them to do multiple tasks. Um, and so learning is somehow at test time where the model has read a lot of say GPT-3 or something, right? It has read a lot of text online, but you can just give it a few examples at test time and get it to predict things. Um, how does that sort of purely uh, inference time performance or, or something that doesn't involve the usual notion of learning? How do you think that would fit in with something like this? And I guess more recently they have that multimodal versions of that as well, right? Like clip and, and stuff where you have an image representation and language representation, but you never fine tune anything, you just ask it. Um, yeah, I'm just curious how you think that fits in with all this. So you mean uh, fitting in the whole framework of declarative learning-based programming? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the last part of it, yeah. Okay. So actually that's interesting. I don't know if I have the picture of like, um, let's see the framework that I have. Um, so maybe here, maybe. So actually I had a, a snapshot of like the, the system level, how this declarative learning-based framework uh, works. Um, and that is uh, basically a feedback loop that you have, we have the notion of sensors that if I have a strong sensors that's pre-trained model, so that's perfect. We need to be able to use it as a black box and get representations. But now you're talking about fine tuning as a kind of prediction time inference. You, you count that fine tuning right. of training, but as the inference time, right? So that's kind of like, it can be in a feedback loop when I'm using this pre-trained and I'm using like this, um, new problem, but, and I try examples, it doesn't work, then I'm going to look for sources of information and add that information to my model. So it means that I need a quick loop, a feedback loop for adding examples, I think. And actually that fits a lot here because uh, we, we, the goal is like to be able to change the models in terms of data, defining the source of supervision or the form of the examples. Uh, like declaratively for the model, because you might have a source that uh, has the information that you want, but the form of the example is not as you want, right? So you want to declaratively write how, what will be the out, the input that you want to extract from this source, what will be the output? So I think I have a picture, I can uh, look at it actually, let me to bring up. One more. So do you this, do you see this? Mm -hmm. yeah. So here actually, this is the, uh, the 
system level snapshot that I imagine. And we have sensors that are pre-trained model that you're talking about. And then here we have the loop of feedback that the final decision is given and the expert can, can give add to the data quickly. And that is the, the feedback loop that you can fine tune models quickly and declaratively defining your new data. Hopefully that's, that's the way that we can go here. But actually I hadn't think about like fine tuning as the prediction time. Yeah, that's that's interesting point actually. Yeah, interesting. Um, there's one question in the chat. Uh, Abhishek, do you want to unmute yourself or? Uh... Um, so the... Yeah, let me let me ask. I just uh, was uh, curious about like the like so currently the this uh, language model or the system that is being built is for like English based or English language, but how what kind of problems do you think will be encountered if you have to like uh, use it for other languages? I think the advantage of language model. Uh, yeah, is the question finished? Um, so the, the advantage of language models that is training them is unsupervised, right? So I don't see any issues. Actually, this is really great because this vision and language uh, like work currently, we can learn representations without manual supervision. So we can put like all these uh, sentences from a specific language and learn representations by just like masking, like predict this, predict that and learn representations. Uh, this is for vision as well. You can like uh, reduce, uh, like re remove some part of your image and then have the model learn to repair that. So, and that doesn't need actually labeling effort. Also for combining vision and language, that's also like multimodal representations. So as far as language representations, uh, like language models go uh, and training those, I don't think there is an issue with, um, with actually multi-languages, but then the issue is of fine tuning is there, right? When I want to do a task, then if I learn the task in a different language and I have annotated data for that, now I need to do an effort to, to do this in a new language. And assuming that we uh, these pre-trained models give us a pretty good representation and the um, additional data set for fine tuning shouldn't be huge, hopefully that we are going to the good direction of being able to do lingual issues. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me stop the recording at this point. Uh, thanks a lot, Parisa. Uh, she's going to be around if people want to have questions and discuss this book with her. But yeah, thank you. Thank you.